Thanks very much, and thanks for the opportunity to come to Uruguay again. I have had the pleasure of being here many times. Um, the first time was about 18 years ago, and things have changed quite a lot uh, since that time for the better. So uh, I was asked today to talk a bit about developments in genetic and genomic evaluation of Pan-American cattle. And I've had quite a lot of grief from some of you asking me if I didn't know where I lived since I had two addresses on my name tag. So just to clarify that, I have a nine-month academic position. They pay me for nine months of the year at Iowa State University. And I also have a part-time position in the vet school at Massey University in New Zealand, where I started working in my academic career in 1982. Uh, but I also wear another hat. I am the co-founder of a company that develops software for genetic and genomic evaluation, and I'll be talking very briefly about that as well. So uh, when I was asked to speak, I was given a, a little letter that said I, uh, they would like me to cover these particular topics, and then after I'd done this, I could uh, talk to you about whatever I liked but it's probably going to take me most of the time from now to coffee to, to cover these issues. So that's just what I'm going to cover today. And the, the really critical issue to it all is breeding values. Breeding values is central to everything about genetic improvement. And a breeding value is twice the superiority or inferiority that you would see in a large number of offspring if an animal was bred to randomly chosen mates. And the reason it's twice is because, as Donna and others have mentioned, chromosomes in, in mammals are in pairs, but only one member of each pair ends up in the sperm or the egg. So the superiority we see in the offspring only represents half the superiority in the sire. So for technical reasons, we like the use of, of EBVs. Um, but one of my colleagues at Iowa State many years ago, uh, Richard Willem, decided that that was a little bit of a hard concept to, for producers to understand, that if you said a bull had an EBV of 10 kilos, you'd only see 5 kilos superiority in the offspring. So he coined the term EPD and divided that number by half. Uh, and that's what some countries use on their catalogue. So... Uh, I'll use a little bit of either, but basically one is just half of the other. So there is a breeding value for each and every trait. Every one of us in the audience have a breeding value for all kinds of things. We have an, a breeding value associated with our immunity system, our ability to live a long time, or our growth, or our fatness, and so on. You, we may not know what those breeding values are, but they exist and they determine what genetic change occurs in a population. And this is true whether the population is performance recorded or not, and it's also true whether the population is under artificial or natural selection. And if we knew the breeding values of all the selection candidates at a young age, it would be very, very easy to make genetic progress. But unfortunately, we can't see the breeding values, or at least often we can't see them very reliably. So um, what we see often, if we looked at some animals, this, this is just represents the phenotypic observation. So on, on the y-axis, I'm representing the weaning weight of some animals. And on the x-axis, I'm representing the birth weight. And each spot might represent the phenotype of a particular animal for birth weight and weaning weight. So that's what you might see if you were to take these measurements in your herd and to plot them. And the first thing you'll notice is that they're not random. It's not a circle. They're, 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 they tend to be on an ellipse. And that's because the breeding values associated with birth weight have something to do with growth, and they also influence weaning weight. So there tends to be a slope, and they are positively correlated. Now, in most cases, you don't want to do single trait selection or even select for two traits. You want to select for many traits that affect the satisfaction of running your Hereford cattle. Now, I can't imagine what it would look like if we could draw this graph for four or five traits, but if we could draw it for three traits, it would represent some kind of a cloud or a swarm. So what you're really interested in doing is taking that swarm and using selection to move it. 
And what we know from many, many years of selection experiments is one thing we can't do about selection is change the variation very much. So we can't change the fact that we have some animals that are born with lighter than average birth weights and some with heavier than average birth weights. But we can move the mean, we can move the average. So we can move the swarm up or down or to the left or the right and which way it moves just depends on what the breeding values are of the animals that we use as parents. And that's true whether we've measured their phenotypes or not. So what is genetic prediction? It's just a way to try and estimate what those real breeding values are that we can't see. And any pedigree breeder would tell you that the pedigree has some value, that's why breed associations have recorded it, because the breeding value tells us, the pedigree tells us something about the parents of the individual. So the pedigree information tells us something about the breeding value because some families are better than others on average. Now, a lot of breeders are very, very interested in the phenotype. When you look at a bull, uh, particularly in the show circumstances, you're interested in, in what that bull looks like. And as far as I'm concerned, that's not something that interests me. A bull is just an envelope of his DNA. And I'm actually not interested in what the bull looks like. I'm interested in the DNA that he has in the envelope. So what I'm interested in is what his progeny look like or his grand progeny look like. That's what interests me, and that's determined by his DNA, not by the envelope he happens to be in. But individual information does tell us something about his breeding value, but only information on the individual relative to his herd mates. So how much superior or inferior his phenotype tells us a little bit. But how much it tells us depends on a, tra on a uh, concept we refer to as heritability. And Donna showed you some of those values. Heritability is just the strength of the association between phenotype and genotype, or the strength of association between the envelope you can see and the contents of the envelope, which is the DNA. But the best es estimation of breeding value comes from the performance of progeny. So if you think about a population, and you're familiar with looking at pedigree trees where you see an animal with two parents and four, gra four grandparents and so on, but if you plot every animal in the population together, it looks a little bit more like a spider web I'm showing you here. And if you look at any particular individual in that spider web, uh, it's going to have two parents and it might have one or more offspring. So when we come to do prediction of breeding values, there are actually only three sources of information on any individual. Even though you might have millions of animals in the pedigree over many generations, there's only what we know about the two parents, what we know about the individual's performance, and what we know about his offspring. So what we do in conventional genetic prediction is we combine those three sources of information. Okay, <clears throat> so um, if there are not a lot of offspring and if the trait is not high heritability, then the prediction of the breeding value is going to have errors, what we call prediction errors. But it turns out that the methods we use for prediction, the prediction errors are equally likely to be positive or negative. And to give you the simplest example, if you sh told me that you had an animal which was a Hereford and that was all you told me, the, the EBV that I would give that animal would be the breed average EBV. Now, I know that's not the right answer, but on average it's the right answer. So it's equally likely the individual is better than that or that the animal is worse than that. On average, I will be correct. If you tell me a little bit more who the sire of the animal is, then I will adjust my estimate up or down a little bit. But it will still be correct on average, but it could have some errors. And as I get more and more information, the prediction errors are going to get smaller and smaller. And the breeding value that I report, the EBV, will be closer to his true BV. So one of the things that tells me is that trends in population EBV reflect trends in the true BV. 
And this actually hasn't been known all that long. It was only in the 1980s that this concept was actually uh, uh, identified. Prior to that, we thought we had to use control information. We had to use control or unselected animals to sell if we had genetic trend. So one of the things people like myself do are we, is we look at genetic trends to see what's happening. And this is genetic trends for the American Hereford Association out of the PACE evaluation. And on the uh, y-axis, I've shown the EPD in pounds for those people who are used to EPD systems, but that's more or less the same as the EBV measured in kilos. So you take your choice as to how you want to interpret it. We've got year of birth on along the bottom for the last 35 years, and those are the trends for yearling weight and for weaning weight. And the first thing you'll notice is is they are not linear. They looks like there are two phases where the rate of improvement in weight is not as much as it used to be. And one of the things someone like myself would do is look at these and say, how do those compare to theoretical rates of gain? That gives me an idea on what the selection efficiency is in your programs. Well, it doesn't take too much thinking to work out why it is that the slope for increases in growth rate declined, it's because in 1990 ultrasound evaluations of carcass information were released. So prior to 1990, all people had to select on was growth rate, so they put a lot of emphasis on growth. But in 1990, when there was ultrasound information, they started to select for a combination of growth and carcass or predicted carcass merit and that's why there's a slower improvement in yearling weight and if we looked at the trends in carcass traits we would see that they increased at the time that it went slower for, um, for weight. Total herd reporting, one of the uh, traits that we really want to change is reproductive performance and we've heard a bit about that already, how important that is, but you can only do that if you have total herd reporting. We can't look at a pedigree file and identify the good cows if we don't know when the cows had a calf. If only the good calves are reported, which used to be the practice in the past, then we can't analyse reproductive data from normal breed association records. So one of the critical things is to bring in total herd reporting. And in Herefords, that came in in 2000, but there are still many breeds in the world that don't have total herd reporting. 2006, I believe, is when the Pan Am evaluation came, where they combined data from other countries, and you won't see any change in the rate of progress when Pan Am came along from the perspective of this graph, which is North America, but the, the uh, USA at least, because USA is the dominant provider of the data in this evaluation. You might see a different picture if you were to look at the trends from one of the other three partner com countries. And there about 2011 is when genomics came along, and I would have liked to have seen an increase in the progress when genomics came along, but when it first came out, there was not much use of it. I hope that over the next few years, we will see a shift because of genomics. So I mentioned Pan Am. For those of you who don't know what it is, it's a combined evaluation that uses data from Argentina, Canada, Uruguay, and the US. And formally, it's an agreement between those four breed associations and ABRI, who runs the evaluation for them, currently using breed plant software. And you just heard from Rob Banks, there are other examples of these sort of combined data analyses, like the Trans-Tasman between New Zealand and Australia. But just to show you how it works, on the left-hand side we have several different breed association databases, the American Hereford, Canadian Hereford, the Uruguayan and the Argentine, and they all put their data together, their pedigree and trait data, to go to an evaluation. And this is all done by ABRI, and it's very easy to draw this graph, but this is actually a nightmare. Combining the data from those four places where people use different identification systems in the different countries is a big task. So because it's a big task, you only want to do this a couple of times a year. 
And the data that comes out, the pedigree and trait data, goes into breed plan. And from what I understand, it takes a couple of days to run that analysis. And the results come back as EPDs. And then they are sent back to each of the four uh, co cooperating breed associations. So the previous results I showed you are from this combined analysis, but they are only based on, on animals that were born and registered in the American Hereford Association. So you might, uh, you might ask yourself the question I would ask myself, which is why am I here telling you this? Because I've got nothing to do with any of that process. And my role is as a researcher is to try and look at these kind of things and see how could we do it better and to publish the results, make suggestions and hope that somebody in this industrial exercise can identify the suggestions we make and incorporate it into the system. So let's talk about genomic prediction. So genomic prediction is, is based on an idea that we can use knowledge of gene variants that are carried on the genome of an individual to predict its, its BV or its breeding value. So an animal is inferior or superior because it has genes in its DNA or variants of DNA that result in better or poorer performance. So ideally what we would use in, in genomic prediction is we would use the actual variants that cause all the changes in a particular trait and we would just look at the DNA and work out those values and tell you what the EBV of the animal is. The trouble is right now um, we really only know the actual variants for a few inherited defects and some simply inherited traits, things like coat colour and horns, and we know a few of them that affect traits like growth or reproduction, but most of them we don't know them. So instead what we use are marker variants like the 50k chip, which is just a, a, a product that measures 50,000 of these variants spread along the 30 chromosome pairs, and they're more or less evenly spaced, with the hope that wherever there is a real variant, there should be a marker somewhere nearby. Now, all of this technology comes about not because we dreamt this up as being a good thing to do. It's all come about because of a massive interest in personalised medicine. All of the tools we use to do these things were developed for human prediction of disease and other performance. So the genotyping machines we use were developed for human work, the sequencing machines were developed for human work. So they got the first data and the first opportunity to play these kind of a game. Now I don't have time to show you all of the background theory, but basically we go along the genome and we look at each of the 50,000 variants and we see if they're associated with a particular trait. Now you heard already about reference populations. In the human case, they would normally try and have at least 100,000 individuals in a reference population. So a reference population, they might have knowledge about whether somebody had Alzheimer's or not, and they have all of the, the SNP genotypes, and they find an association. It turns out there's quite a good association, a gene called APOE. So here is a prediction of my likelihood of getting Alzheimer's disease and they only found one gene that had good predictive ability. You can see my risk of Alzheimer's is a little bit less. I have about a 0.7 probability of getting Alzheimer's compared to an average person in the population. So if I forget what I'm saying, it's probably to do with the wine tasting last night and, and not to do with uh, Alzheimer's. But there are other traits where there may be more than just one gene found. And so this is the same thing. This is personalised medicine predictions of coronary heart disease. So in coronary heart disease, they found a number of different genes that had an association with heart disease. And in each of those genes, there's a variant that is good, it reduces heart disease, or a variant that's bad that increases heart disease. And this shows my prediction my EBV for heart disease by summing up the effects of all of those variants. And you see I have some red ones, which means I have inferior alleles, and I have some green ones. I have slightly more red ones than I do green ones, so I have a slightly higher chance of getting heart disease than would a random person in the population. 
So that's exactly the same technology that we use in genomic prediction in dairy cattle and beef cattle and pigs and chickens and so on, except that we don't go and just find the few biggest significant effects. We say we are going to believe all of the effects we estimate. They are the best estimates, and we're going to use the best estimates rather than using just the significant estimates. So when we predict the birth weight of an animal, we don't just use 5 or 10. We use all 50,000 of our predictions. So how is it being done today? Well, basically, this is my involvement in this PACE evaluation, was that I was provided pedigree and EPD information from PACE, and I was provided genotypes from PACE, and I was provided funding by the US government that allowed us to do exactly the same kind of analyses that were done to find the Alzheimer's or coronary heart disease effects in humans. And out of that, we came up with a prediction equation, much like the ones I just showed you, and we put them onto a computer at one of the genotyping providers in the US, GeneSeq. And this is an organization that does most of the genotyping in the US, so it has better prices because of economy of scale. And they were uh, interested in promoting this technology to beef breeders, and they were happy to take samples from even one or just two animals at a time, rather than requiring tens or hundreds of samples to be sent in at once, which is what normally happens with these kind of genotyping companies. So the prediction equation sits at GeneSeq, and whenever a breeder sends in a hair sample or a blood sample to GeneSeq, the computer programs there that we developed for them automatically come up with a prediction, and those predictions go back to ABRI, who then blends them with the pedigree and EPD information, and can provide them back to each of the partner breed associations. And that's known as a two-step approach. It involves blending using selection index theory. So when we first did it, we, we did our predictions based on 1,000 animals in our reference population, and then we did it on 3,000. We got more animals genotyped by subsidizing the genotype of herd sires. This just shows you how much the data had grown by May 2015, we had about 21,000 animals genotyped from, uh, from the four companies, uh, countries involved in the PACE evaluation. And uh, one of the things that we see looking at the data is that this, this growth in number of animals being genotyped is mostly occurring because people that were early adopted who started off just by testing one or two animals are now testing more animals in their calf crop. So on the, on the y-axis here, I've got the proportion of a birth group that are genotyped. And you can see at 2014, it's got up to about about 40%. So people who were doing the genotyping, so this might be a, a group of males that were born this year, they're, they're doing not just the best calf, they're doing maybe 40% of the calves in that group. We would like to see them doing 100%, that would, would give us a, a lot better predictions than just having them do the best 40%. The, the, the number that we're seeing genotyped by birth year is improving hugely. It's, uh, as you see, a big number done in 2014, many, many more than in 2013. And I didn't show you on that graph the latest ones because I didn't have them broken down by their sex. But this is the numbers that I had uh, just as I was getting on the plane the other day. So we're now up to 33,000 that are genotyped. So that's an increase of about 12,500 in the last 12 months. And my guess is we're going to see even greater uh, increases in the amount of genotyping as we move forward from now on. So there's actually genotyping done. I, we, we often talk about the 50K, and you hear us about 50K because it was the first chip that became available. But there are actually many, many different chips. So the data I have is represented by all these chips here. The ones that I mostly get today are either on the 40K or the 150K, and some animals on a 250K, which is what we call a functional chip, where the only variants on that chip are actual changes in genes that we expect will modify performance. So they come from sequence data and they are ones which we think will be better candidates to put on future versions of the chip. 
So how are we going to do this in future? We don't like this uh, blending approach. It's, uh, it's, it's problematic. Uh, we really want to go to a single step, and we have a number of new models for doing that, and there's a workshop tomorrow that some people will be attending where we're going to go into some of the scientific details about the single step approach. There's actually quite a number of single step approaches, about a dozen that I know of, and uh, they vary quite a lot in their, in their computational aspects, but um, all of them end up generating a, an EPD and a reliability. There's new software, so ABRI will be using this software called Bolt rather than Breed Plan for these evaluations, and Bolt was developed by the company that I mentioned I was a co-founder on. And the other thing that will change in the future is there'll be new variants on the marker panels. So we expect every few months new chips will come out that have better features on them. So the markers are going to successively evolve to give us better and better chips. And I think in future we may use a lot less markers than we're using now, but instead of them being markers, they'll be causal variants. And I think we'll also start routinely sequencing widely used bulls. Right now, that's costing me about $2,000 to do, and I have sequenced every one of the bulls that is used in the university herd, and I know that there are 14 million variants that are segregating in our university herd of about 400 cows. So the software bolt, this is uh, my partner Bruce Golden here developing the software. Uh, what's different about the software that we've developed is that we have uh, written software that works on graphics processes. Some of you may have uh, children or know somebody else who are into playing these computer games, and these computer games have animation where uh, images can change on the screen very, very quickly. And in order to do that, they had to develop fast processing power, and they developed it on something called a graphics board, and that's what you see in the, in the image in the middle on the top. That's a graphics card that plugs into a computer and connects to the screen. Well, it turns out we can trick these graphics cards into doing the calculations we need to do for genetic prediction or genomic prediction. And the gaming animation industry is worth more than $100 billion a year. And a lot of that money gets spent on development of these graphics cards. This is a picture of the largest computer, high-performance computer in the US. It's called Titan. And uh, it's actually a Cray computer at the Oak Ridge Laboratory. It's the second fastest computer in the world, at least it was a few weeks ago. That could change soon. Uh, it has about 19,000 computers inside it. And each one of those computers has 16 cores or processing units. So it's got many, many, many processing units. But in addition, it has 19,000 of those graphics cards in it. And that's what gives it the real processing power. And the reason it's called Titan is that one version of these graphics cards is known as a Titan. This is my supercomputer. The one on the right, the most expensive one I have, is an $8,000 computer, which is much, much cheaper than I would have to pay to buy a fraction of the large high-performance computer that we use for research. And uh, there's a couple of things you'll notice about it. One is the power supply. Down the bottom, that's a 1,500-watt power supply. A normal desktop computer would only have about 600 because you need a bit more power to drive these graphics cards. And I have four graphics cards on the one on the right, and each graphics card is ca capable of simultaneously doing thousands of calculations. And then the, the, the processor, the normal computer processor up on the top, is cooled by a radiator, so you see some hoses coming out of it. And that means that uh, we can make it work a bit harder and it won't get too hot. So uh, what do those kind of things do for you? Well, this is just showing you running the conventional analysis using only the American Hereford Association data, about 4.5 million animals for growth, compared to running the whole pace evaluation with 6 million animals growth. The, the predictions we get from pedigree compared to the pace evaluations have correlations round about 0.99. So we're getting virtually the same answers even though we're not using the same data. 
and even though we're not running every one of the traits in together. There are about 4.5 million animals, and I told you that the breed plan analysis takes about two 12, uh, takes about two days to do. This analysis on my cheap computer took 12 minutes from taking those raw data files, building and solving the equations, and another one hour to get the accuracies, and not the approximate accuracies, but to get the accuracies from what we call a Markov chain Monte Carlo. So that means if you could generate the data easily for Pan American, you could run this evaluation multiple times a day. Or you, at the very least, you could run it every day or you could run it every week, instead of running it just twice a year. But the problem about running it twice a year is the nightmare of combining all of the IDs together. And that is the weak part of the system when we talk about these international collaborations. And just to give you another comparison down the bottom, the software the American Angus Association uses to do the same model, they have eight and a half million animals, it takes them about 12 hours. And we have done much bigger, in fact we recently done, did some with 43 million animals on a, on a dairy system. But the other nice thing about this is that when we calculate the accuracy um, we get much more accurate predictions than we do without genomics. So here I'm showing you the prediction error variance. So this is the size of the errors rather than the accuracy on the y-axis. So a high number on the y-axis means big errors. A low number on the y-axis means low errors. So on the left-hand side of the graph, you can see progeny-tested bulls with accurate predictions. On the very, very right side, you're seeing genotyped animals that don't even have their phenotype measured. And the green line represents the accuracy using only pedigree, and the blue line represents the accuracy when we in include the genotype information. And you can see we get quite a big jump in accuracy using one of the single-step models. But there's actually another single step model that we like, which makes the assumption that some of the markers don't actually have a real effect. So we actually use what's called a mixture model or variable selection model to find the best features that predict the trait. And you can see going from the middle line to the bottom line, that's extra accuracy you're buying just by using that particular statistical technique that we've incorporated in one of these models. So how is this going to work? Well, ABRI has a license to use the software, so they will be running the evaluation internally using this bulk software and providing it back pretty much like it was in the past. So how is this stuff going to be used? Well, in its simplest form, genomic predictions are used exactly the same way you do any other prediction. You just get an EPD and you use an accuracy. So you use that just like you would use it, regardless of how, what information went into that EPD or accuracy. The interpretation is exactly the same as before. The only thing you'd notice is the accuracy is higher than it would have otherwise been. In a more complex form, you might want to do some of the kinds of things that Donna talked about. You might want to, to get a good variant into a family that it doesn't currently exist in, or you might to eliminate an offspring that has an undesirable variant. Uh, and ultimately, we will end up gene editing some of these variants. We know that there are several major genes. There's four or five major genes that affect growth and reproduction Hereford cattle. And one of the things we notice is that the population is over, uh, overwhelmingly enriched by heterozygotes, which means that unwittingly you don't like the homozygotes and you are continuously selecting animals which are heterozygous. And that's not a very efficient way of doing selection. So we think knowing about those variants will make a difference. So what decisions can the breeder make? Well, basically, the breeder has a number of opportunities to purchase increased accuracy. So the, the cheapest information you have is you know the pedigree, you know the parent average. But everything else you do to the animal is a purchase to improve its accuracy. If you weigh it, that is a fairly cheap purchase to find out about its phenotype. If you ultrasound scan it, that's a slightly more expensive investment. Uh, if, you, if you put it through a grow safe system to get dry matter intake, that's a more expensive investment. 
You can purchase progeny records that will give you a big boost in accuracy. That's the gold standard, but it takes a whole lot of time and it takes quite a lot of money. Uh, genotyping allows you to make this purchase at a younger age. So how much the accuracy goes up depends on how uh, predictive each of these uh, gene tests are, and it varies a little bit from trait to trait, but this would be what it would look like for a, a poor accuracy prediction, and on the x-axis I have how accurate the prediction was using pedigree, and on the y-axis I have how accurate it is using pedigree and genomic information. And what you see is if an animal was already accurately predicted, the genotyping isn't going to add anything. The genotyping adds the most value when you know nothing about the animal, which is when it is first born. And this is what the graph will look like for a, uh, a, a, a more accurate genomic prediction, one that has had a bigger training population. You get a bigger boost when you do the in initial investment. And how much increase you get is going to be different for every one of the traits. So summary, genomic prediction will not improve the accuracy of bulls that already have reliable breeding values. Genomic breeding values are equally likely to be better or worse than their pedigree EVVs. Sometimes the breed associations get calls by breeders complaining about the bulls that turned out to be worse than they thought they should have been. I've never had a complaint about a breeder uh, ringing up and saying a bull's turned out to be better than we thought he was. Um, genomic prediction mostly increases the accuracy of predictions of young animals. Selection using genomic data will be more accurate than conventional prediction and can increase the rate of genetic improvement provided you believe in the predictions and use them to choose your parents. The technology will become more cost effective because as we see increased adoption it's going to make the prediction accuracies better. Donna showed you that the reference population size going up will increase the accuracy. So everybody else genotyping will improve the accuracy of your genotypes. Genotyping costs are coming down a bit, particularly if you can buy them in bulk. If you can order a million of them like the Irish have done, you get a much better price than we're currently paying. But each of you as individual breeders, you have to make your own decision about the value proposition of the genotyping and decide if that's the way you want to purchase extra accuracy of your decisions. And PACE breeders, the Pan American Cattle Evaluation Contributors, are at the forefront of these developments in the Hereford breed. Thank you very much. Thank you.